Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. October was only two years old. She was living in a one bedroom with four adults and two kids, and no one cared enough to get help for her, including her own mother. They ignored noises of beatings and cries for help and went on with their selfish lives as if nothing was happening. Their silence would lead to a brutal death. Thanks to established titles for sponsoring today's video. You guys know I love established titles. Thanks to all of you that are supporting the channel and have already ordered your certificate. Established titles is so fun and it puts a smile on your face because they take the old Scottish custom that anyone who owns land, you are considered a lord or a lady. Therefore, established titles offers you to buy land. And what is cool is it's one square foot of land ownerships give you the title of Lord or Lady. I got one for myself, and I think this is the perfect gift to the person that is so hard to buy for because they have everything or a young one that's into princesses and castles. I got one for my granddaughters. I'll show you them again because I'm a little shameless, but more proud. I just hope it puts a smile on their face when they show it off to their friends. You can put Lord or Lady in front of your name on credit cards or plane tickets. Just imagine your flight is delayed and you are having a hard time getting them to rebook. You can tell them, did you know I was uh, Lady Kimberly Flower? Suddenly, first class. They have options of Lord or Lady as well as couple packages. You and your partner can have adjoining land or if you want to be away from your partner, I guess that's an option too. <laughs> Just kidding. I think this would also be an amazing wedding gift. It's unique and it's better than a set of steak knives. <laughs> you get the plot number on the piece of land you own. Last but definitely not least, established titles has dedicated themselves to planting a tree with every order all over the world. They are partnered with one tree planted as well as trees for the future. These organizations help the efforts of reforestation. You can feel good that your purchase is helping the environment. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or lady, we can build our little community, our little Kimberly Flower rock star community. Right now, Established Titles is running their Black Friday sale. They are offering my viewers an additional 10% off their purchase by clicking the link in my description box and using code Kim Flower at checkout. That's establishedtitles.com forward slash Kim Flower linked below as well. Thanks to Established Titles for sponsoring today's video and thanks to all of you for listening. On October 23rd, 2011, Christy Perez called 911 to say her little girl October was unresponsive. She told them that she had no idea what happened to her child, but she heard her whimpering in her bed and now she couldn't get her to respond. When the paramedics arrived, they were escorted to a dark, unfinished, filthy, and dangerous basement where the little child lay on her broken bed frame with a shredded mattress with no sheets. They found the two-year-old October who was barely conscious and immediately put her on their stretcher and got her to the waiting ambulance. Once the paramedics got little October into the emergency hospital, the doctors tried to help her, but they knew she needed more than what they could provide. So she was immediately med flighted to Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, where she was put on life-saving equipment. That means that at this point, October wasn't able to breathe on her own or pump blood into her little organs. So she was put on a respirator. The doctors had a very hard task of informing her family that little two-year-old October Ann Perez 
was brain dead. Now the parents had some explaining to do, but first let's go back to the beginning. October Ann Perez was born on January 10th, 2009 in Great Falls, Montana to her mom, Christy Perez. At the time, Christy was married to Freddie Perez and he believed October was his because Christy was keeping the true paternity a secret. October had an older half-brother, Xavier Perez, who was indeed Freddie's child. However, October's biological dad was Michael Arndt. Michael was in the army, stationed in Afghanistan. He was actually in town when October was born, but wasn't there for her birth because of this lie. Christy was married to Freddie and trying very hard to protect the secret of October's true parentage. However, Christy's marriage with Freddie did not last. After she was separated from Freddie, she came clean to October's real dad that he was his. I would have been so furious if I was him, but this shows what kind of person Christy truly is. But just wait, it gets much worse. Unfortunately, Christy's next relationship would be with a very sadistic man named David Hislop. Most of the information we have here is from October's grandma, April Hall. She is a saint for telling October's story. She is the real dad, Michael's mom. So she's the grandma on uh, the dad's side. While Michael was deployed to Afghanistan in the army, April was his proxy in all things. She specifically had his visitation rights for October. In the months leading up to her death, Michael had hired a lawyer and was trying to get his baby girl out of that very dangerous house. Michael said he met David one time and he knew he did not want October anywhere near him. David was special. He had tattoos on his hands. One said F-U-C-K and the other one said P-A-I-N. I'm just wondering who would hire him at a job. What kind of job did he work at? In January, when April got October, oh my gosh, that's so funny because it's so many months, but in January, when April the grandmother got October for her visit, she was so worried and concerned when she seen October. She worried about her safety. She actually made a call to CPS because October had so many bruises, marks, cuts, and scrapes. Also, October's older brother had told her that they were doing drugs in the home in front of the kids. So on January 16th, she reported all of this to social services and it was assigned to a caseworker and her name was Rachel Zins. April thought that something would happen and it did. When the state started an investigation, Christy was angry and wouldn't let April see October and kept her away from seeing her. April was just heartbroken and worried, sick about October, and now April was being cut out. The one safe place for October she was no longer allowed to go to. Prior to this call, Michael had gotten Christy to complete a paternity test with October, which showed what everyone already knew, that she was his little girl. Finally, in February, Christy caved and let April to see her grandbaby, October, again. And the plan was to keep her overnight. She had to pick October up from Christy's mom's house because Christy was still angry at her, and I guess she just didn't want to see her. From the moment April picked her up, October was crying and she didn't stop. Something was wrong with October. This wasn't a normal cry because she was hungry or tired, but there was more going on. And this was not a little cry, like she was sad, but like really crying. April said she cried when she 
uh, was trying to put on her seatbelt, when she tried to take off her coat, when she gave her her sippy cup, October cried. So April called Jamie, who is Christy's mom, because Christy is still not talking to her. April asked, what in the hell happened? Because something was really wrong with October. Jamie said she'd call Christy to find out. Right away, April gets a call back from Christy. So she asks her what is going on with October. Why can't she hold her sippy cup with her two hands? Christy says, mm, I don't know. As far as she knows, nothing is wrong. So April tells her that she is taking October to the emergency room that night. So she'd be over to pick her up so that she could take them. April didn't have any custodial rights, so she couldn't just take October to the doctor without the mom. Well, Christy wants to wait till the next day. She's pretty empathetic about it. Your daughter's in clear pain and you're too busy to take her to the emergency room? So April, seeing that her grandbaby is clearly in pain, refuses to wait and demanded Christy to get off her ass and they needed to go that night. It was a good thing that they went because at the emergency room, because the x-ray showed October had a broken arm. The notes would later show that the doctors considered the break suspicious because the mom could not give an explanation for the injury. Your daughter broke her arm and you have no clue how it happened? Nice, Christy. Well, because of these doctors being concerned and they are mandated reporters, they called the police and Child Protective Services. So at this point, this is the second call to social services and so an investigation was started. Unbelievably, April was given emergency custody for five days. April thought this time social services would take things seriously. The next day, she was told to take October to see her primary care doctor, Dr. Maynard, who ordered a full body scan. This scan showed October's other arm had been previously broken, not treated, and was partially healed. Clearly, October had been through a lot. This day after, April was told to take October to see Dr. Pike, an orthopedic doctor, which she did, and Christy met them there. To be clear, April was not allowed to go back in the patient room at any of these visits. She was met at each doctor's office by the caseworker and Christy, who both went into the room. Only two days later, the caseworker, Rachel Zins, called April and told her that she, her supervisor, Rod Hausman, and the county attorney, John Parker, had a meeting and had decided there was not enough evidence to keep October out of the home. Two broken arms, bruises, scrapes, all that, reported drug use, and that wasn't enough evidence. Therefore, April was ordered by Zins to return October in the next 20 minutes. April was crushed. She knew she had to hand that baby back to get more abuse. She didn't have a choice. I'm sure this was the hardest thing she ever had to do. She found out later October's death that both doctors listed the breaks as probable, not accidental, definitely suspicious. How did this not raise red flags? That is evidence. It's so frustrating. At this point, Zins tells April that because of the breaks in the arms, someone from social services was going to be spending three hours a week in the house. April has absolutely no reason not to trust this. She's never been in a situation where a government employee might lie to her. She certainly had no reason to think that a Child Protective Services employee would know of a child at risk and do nothing to protect the child. I think most of us, until we started watching so much true crime, would have felt the same way. In April, April the grandma was able to get a visit. It seemed like Christy could be talked into a lunch visit because of course this was a free lunch to her because the grandma was paying, which she completely did not mind doing as long as she was able to see October. When they showed up, April was shocked 
because not only was October filthy, but her coat was also black from dirt and her nails had dirt caked under them. She reeked of marijuana and she was half bald and was missing a tooth. To be clear, a large portion of her hair was gone, but it was not shaved or cut. It had either been pulled out or it had fallen out. The tooth was gone and April worked for a dentist who assured her that at two years old, they did not lose their teeth. He also told her to get her grandbaby to a dentist and they would be able to tell her what happened. After lunch, April tried calling CPS, but caseworker Zins was rude and dismissive on the phone. So she and her sister went to the CPS building and waited to meet with her. She thought that the bald spot in the missing tooth would certainly get the caseworker's attention. She just needed her to listen. This should be hard evidence that should prove that this isn't an over-concerned person making these things up. You can physically see it on her. Now, since October had Medicaid, she would need to go to a dentist in Helena, but April volunteered. She didn't mind the long drive. She even said if Medicaid wouldn't cover it, that she would pay for it out of pocket. CPS never approved the visit and the missing tooth and hair were never addressed. Something we'd like to bring up is that kids that have batter syndrome will lose hair due to scalp balding. A professional worker in a department such as CPS would know this. Also, children do not start losing baby teeth until they're around six years old. Sometimes later, of course, there are exceptions and accidents. But again, if October is being abused and battered, the tooth could have been knocked out. As you learn more, that will become more apparent. When the issue with her hair and her tooth happened, Christy said she was going to take her to the doctor and prove something was medically wrong. However, April did go with Christy in October to the doctor who did testing and even did blood work, but nothing was medically wrong with her. Surprise, surprise. Once again, because of contacting CPS, Christy took away visits yet again. However, April's birthday is April 19th. So she finally convinced Christy to let her take them out to dinner the next night. April 20th, unfortunately, that was the last time April would see her grandbaby alive because on April 25th, Christy received papers from Michael's lawyer trying to set up a parenting plan. This doesn't sound like a bad thing to you or me, but... Going forward, Christy refused to even speak to April, let alone visit with October. See, Christy did not want anything in writing when it came to October, her father, or custody. April had started giving her child support, even though it was not ordered. Christy had told her to just give her cash and that they didn't need to keep records of this. One thing we should make very clear here is that Christy was receiving state assistance for October and any child support payments would that were on the record could take away from the money she was getting. Meanwhile, April was still making calls to try and get a dental appointment for October. She believed if they could prove that the tooth didn't fall out because of some mysterious illness, then at least CPS would have to take the threat seriously and possibly remove her from that dangerous home. This is interesting because on June 3rd, April got a phone call from Freddie Perez, who was still Christie's husband at the time. They had split up long ago, but they hadn't divorced yet. And starting in the beginning of the month of April, he had their son, which was October's half-brother, living with him. He called to tell April that he'd gotten a letter from Christy with enclosed photos of October that were meant for her brother. In the letter, Christy tells him October is now missing three teeth and it is evident in the photos as well. 
I'm sure that Christy was mad at April, but I think she was keeping her away from October because she couldn't hide this apparent abuse. Not sure why she'd tell Freddie about it, except for the fact that he lived in Phoenix, and by this point, he knew October was not his child, so maybe she thought that he just wouldn't care. First, April contacted the lawyer that they'd hired, and he sent a letter with a copy of the photos directly to the caseworker, Rachel Zins. Freddie called Rachel Zins also, and he also sent her the copies of the photos. April called the central intake line, which is equivalent to the child abuse hotline, and called Zins herself. April's sister called the central intake line and called Rachel Zins. Finally, Michael, while he's in Afghanistan, also called Rachel Zins. He told her his baby girl had now lost three teeth. She'd had two broken arms and he was very worried. And Rachel Zins cared to the sum of zero. Not sure if you are counting here, but that is five separate people that called. Rachel Zins had a habit of blowing off April's concerns because of the custody issue, except it wasn't an issue. They were just filing paperwork to get scheduled visitations and set up child support. And second, the child had broken bones and missing teeth and losing hair. That's nothing to do with custody here. And how does she explain the call from Freddy Perez. He has no stakes in this. He's just reporting what he saw. We can all agree that there are times when it's hard to prove abuse, when the bruises fade and the child is too young to say what is happening to them. This is not one of those cases. Besides the broken arm, the loss of hair, the teeth, the family had many pictures of the bruising. Most of the time, she had bruises on her forehead, one on her side or the other side, and Christy explained it as October running into the counter. However, in the redacted notes from social services after this case, a worker who was not Zins noted that they saw October purposely ducking near the countertops. At this point, April was not able to see October at all. Social services had closed the case and found no abuse. I, I don't even understand how that is even possible. They offered no services. They're not going to see them that three hours because if they would have gone to see that house for three hours, there is no way they would have let them live there. It was terrible. All the pictures are disgusting. This caseworker did nothing. April said she was hoping that once Mike got home from Afghanistan in August that he would have more pull and they'd be able to get her out of the situation she was in. So in June, April went to her niece's graduation and went to visit New York City with her sisters. On June 23rd, when I was in New York City, we got a call saying that October fell and bumped her head in two different places, once on the sidewalk or on sidewalk in the basement. We don't know which story we were going to stick with. And she was at the emergency room. And we had my, my daughter and my niece go to find out what was going on since we couldn't. And it, the story was horrific. It turned out horrific. So April got her daughter and her niece, who were still in Great Falls, to go to the hospital and find out what was happening with October. The story made no sense to the two sisters. Why would a bump cause a trip to the hospital and furthermore trigger a call who they weren't speaking to April? Christy wasn't talking to April and hadn't for almost two months. So why would she all of a sudden have her mom call to inform her of a minor bump? Well, it wasn't a minor bump. When April's niece called the sisters back, she told them to brace for bad news. October was not going to survive. When she was transported to Great Falls Hospital, they recognized she needed specialized treatment they couldn't provide. They recognized this was a case of severe 
child abuse. So they called the central intake line. They then had her life lifted to Primary Children's Medical Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Shortly after arriving, October was placed on a ventilator and they tried so hard to stop the swelling in her brain. She had a broken back. It just is not in the realm of possibilities that I thought I was going to read in this case. You know how much force this would be on a two-year-old it would take for that to happen? If she had survived this broken back, it would have paralyzed her. But the scan revealed that this was not her first one. She'd had a previous spinal fracture a few weeks earlier that would have caused her a tremendous amount of pain. It went untreated. When she was admitted, she also had a large hematoma to the right side of her head. After the full body scan, they also found that her big toes were broken and both of her little toes were broken. The devastating injury was to the upper spine and head, which is what caused the brain to swell. The family members rushed to Salt Lake City to be by her side. Mike, who was still in Afghanistan, was notified immediately on the 23rd, and he started his trip home as well. Unfortunately, he would not make it in time to say goodbye to his baby girl. October was an organ donor, so on June 25th, just two days after being admitted, she started to decompensate, meaning even after the life-sustaining equipment, there was not, it wasn't enough. She was pronounced dead at 1.28 a.m. They were able to harvest many of her organs so that in her death, she actually brought life. One thing we hadn't talked about are the other people living in the house at 1305 4th Avenue South when October was being abused. So Christy and her two children, Xavier and October, had moved in with David, who was Christy's boyfriend. Also living in the house was David's brother, Kendall, and his girlfriend, Janetta. And this was not a large house. It was a one bedroom. If you followed any true crime, this will ring a big bell for you because how does a two-year-old get battered in a small house but no one notices? Her mom doesn't notice and takes her to the doctor immediately. We've seen moms who've unfortunately chosen their boyfriends over their children. What about Kendall and his girlfriend? I can see Kendall maybe wanting to cover his brother, but what about Janetta? It seems completely ridiculous that this child was brutalized in silence. During the death investigation, Kendall told the police that on that day, he heard David shouting at October to go to bed, followed by three large thuds coming from the basement. When he started to go down, in check, David told him that October was sleeping and the sounds were him hitting his head in the laundry room. See, the kids slept in the basement. This was not a finished basement. This basement was the last type of basement any two-year-old should spend any minute in, let alone sleep in. When I first saw the photos, I thought, sure, it's a basement, but not a place where a baby could access. No, these photos, this is where she was sleeping. There was also a mattress set for Christy and David down there. My question is, where did the CPS worker who was there for three hours a week think all of these people slept? Certainly, if the state of Montana sets a caseworker out to investigate, they would have to know where the children in question sleeps, right? And maybe they would look into the cabinets in the fridge to verify food. This sounds reasonable to me. So how is it that when the investigation into October's murder begins, there is a picture taken the night of the fridge with maggots inside of it? The conditions in the basement were just unsafe and disgusting. There were dirty diapers on the floor and someone had been using the floor drain as a urinal. So David admits in the police interview that he maybe threw her 
or dropped her on the concrete floor while putting her down for her nap. This is after he said he had no idea what happened. Then it changed to maybe the hot dogs were bad, to maybe she slipped on the sidewalk. It kept evolving with how bad her injuries were and how much the police knew. Eventually, he said that after he either threw her or dropped her, he knew it was bad because she did not cry and had a spasm. That's code for having a seizure. He then put her in the bed and left her there. When Christy got home, she heard whimpering and David told her that October was just having a bad dream. Just ignore her, she's fine. So instead of checking on her child, who if is indeed having a bad dream to come soothe her, she left with her boyfriend. They picked up a basket of food, stopped at the convenience store and finally made it home. When they proceeded to have sex a few feet away from where her baby girl was lying, dying. Christy admits to rubbing October's back while she was posturing. And since she was taking a course to become an EMT, she knew what this could mean. Abdominal posturing is a common outcome of severe brain injury and it refers to involuntary or abnormal positioning of the body. It can look like the person is very stiff. Instead of getting help for October when by this point both David and Christy knew she needed help, she was left in severe pain dying just a few feet away. The injury happened around noon and Christy didn't call for help until around 5 30 p.m. Before I tell you David's fate, let me tell you about October. October wasn't very talkative, mainly because no one had been talking to her. No one had been teaching her words and reading to her, but she could say da-da. And she also didn't have any toys in the house. Above all things, October loved to play. She wasn't the kid you'd see parked in front of the TV, and she always was going in, around and playing. When she was at Grandma April's house, she had a tricycle toy and rode through the house like crazy on it. She also had three little rubber ducks that she loved to carry around. Grandma April had a golden retriever and there was a little basket of dog toys, but regularly October would take over the basket, deciding the toys were hers and the battle would ensue. She also loved snow. She loved playing in it. She loved the crunch sound it made under her boots when she was walking outside. But the thing October loved above all was other people's boots and shoes. She would step into her grandma's boots with her own shoes still on, and of course the boots would go all the way up to her bum, but she was such an expert. She'd keep right on playing, chasing the dog with her little duckies all while wearing her grandma's boots. We've gone over all the people that lived in the one bedroom house and although more than one is certainly guilty to some degree, only David would be charged. While October was still on life support, he was charged with attempted deliberate homicide, which was changed to a charge of deliberate homicide when she was declared dead. There is something I haven't mentioned yet, which is that David lost custody of his own children in Oklahoma much earlier to drug charges. That is everything that CPS would have well known and been aware of. After a trial in which the defense tried very hard to blame the death on Christie and even Kendall, the jury deliberated for four hours and found him guilty. The judge sentenced him to 100 years with no parole. This was in part because they showed no remorse at all. Despite this devastating tragedy, October's grandma April went on to fight for legislation to get oversight brought to Montana's State Department Family Services and under the umbrella of the Cascade County Child Services Division. You'll be happy to know that Rachel is no longer working for the state of Montana. Now she lives in Haver and is the social worker for a nursing home. I'm not sure who lied, but after October's murder, when the county attorney John Parker met with October's family, he denies ever hearing of October prior to June 23rd, when she was fatally assaulted. 
It was possible Rachel Zins made up the story about how she, her supervisor, and the county attorney had a meeting and decided that they didn't have enough uh, cause to keep October from returning her home. As I've said, Rachel no longer works for the state of Montana. John Parker is now a judge. There is a local nonprofit that was in memory of October. It's called Toby's House. They provide crisis, respite, and transitional care for children of ages zero to six. They provide families, struggling parents, with an option, a place to go. They cover crisis care, so maybe it's not safe to be at your house. You can bring your children there for a few hours. Maybe you have a job interview or can't afford to miss work while waiting for a daycare referral. It could be that you need a timeout, the moment away from making sure that your child is cared for. That's what Toby's house is for. It's free and it's available to the public having no income requirements. Because they are a nonprofit, they do rely on donations. They have a link on their page for donations if you would like to check it out, tobyshousemt.org. If you'd like to make a donation, I'm going to make one. I find it incredibly sad that the mom gets to walk around free when she clearly knew something was happening with her daughter. I don't think October got her full justice, but at least we know that the POS David is not getting out. I guess we have no choice but to accept it. Let's leave a pink heart for little October and her surviving family, not her mom. She 100% gets karma. Let me know what you think of this case. It is a sad one, a tragic one, and a preventable one. And also let me know what cases you would like to see me cover next. Thanks to all my channel members and Patreons who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos or decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop, or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you are rock stars and I love you to death. There is more true crime videos in my Crimey Cases playlist if you'd like to check it out. Either way, stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.